I, I think you should introduce her. Yeah. Yes. Uh, she is the professor working on our humanities department, uh, Dr. Jena Mani. Jinnia Mukherjee. sorry. Jinnia Mukherjee. Uh, she has joined two years back, right? Am I right? Uh, June 2016. June 2016, almost two years is over. So she is working on the social issues of the water. And in fact, that she conducted one year back. One and a half years back, a IQT program on how the social and the water put together. So, because uh, people have to convince, like yesterday, sir was telling about the, the uh, you know, sir has given the example. Uh, same thing with the wastewater, we directly treat and reuse it, people will not accept. So, first putting in the river, then people are thinking, yes, to convince themselves, you know. Uh, you know, to like misguide or convince whatever word you can use, then the same river water, if you see Delhi, uh, the Yamuna is not very good quality. Most of the rivers, because of the quality is less. It's not a uh, the river problem, because availability of water is less, so dilution is less. That's the reason. Now more uh, contamination is coming. So when the people directly taking the river water. So at least they are happy they are saying the river water is coming to plant. But uh, almost it's the same, you know, much difference in the quality. So it's a more like a psychology of the people. So how will Indian countries we have to work out? Other countries people still accept it, you know, because they have confidence that the engineers must have checked all the parameters which is required and if it is accurate. So here that part is uh, still uh, missing. So we have to take some of the social issues. And uh, now I will request her to take that. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, let me continue with what Dr. Gupta said. One of the problems we see in all the Indian households, we have a water treatment system. You have either aqua guard or you have uh, RO or some carbon filter, it does not matter. You have something. We, at least every middle class house I have ever been to last for 30 years, they have something to treat water. But the interesting thing is, if you look at it, the way it is operated and maintained, the households are actually polluting the water more than what happens is, if you have an aqua guard or if you have a carbon filter, if you have an RO, if you do not change the membrane or the filter every three to four months, that filter or the membrane becomes a source of contamination. Okay. So, all water you get, sometimes I think this is my hypothesis. The reason Indian people do not get sick, because we have developed strong immunity, strong immunity. Uh, including myself, I have been outside from India for 50 years. I remember one major meeting in Turkey not so long ago. There is a lot of international people in the hotel. In the morning and I went to breakfast, I did not see anybody. I said, this is very strange, 9 o'clock the meeting starts, nobody is there. So I asked, what happened to my friends? So the waiter said, sir, you must be a tough person. I said, what happened? He said, all your friends are in the hospital. Huh? I had no problem, I went to bed, slept like a baby, got up the next morning, I ate the same food like the rest. All my western friends are in the hospital with problem. Apparently at night all hell broke loose. Uh, they were in bacteria is taking advantage of that. You don't you don't change your filter. There's even though you have a contract and of course you have to pay for it. Membrane is quite expensive. If you are worried about contamination, the as Dr. Gupta said, the water may be coming quite clean. But the main source of contamination in the Indian context or a Singaporean context or any context are the overhead tanks. You must clean your overhead tanks. If you are in an urban system, 
if you do not clean your overhead tanks at least every 3 or 4 months, that is where the contamination takes place. And I do not know, very few people actually clean the tank regularly every 3 months. They want to save some money and that is where all the contamination takes place, the overhead tanks. And the reason you do not suffer anything is because as I said, you have extremely, you have developed extremely strong immunity from, from the time you were a kid when you fell, as, fell sick umpteen times, but you have strong immunity and the, all these bugs can't do very much. You just eat them for breakfast, yeah. okay. So, and the <coughs> private sector is taking advantage of it saying they are sub selling you a bunch of goods which is supposed to provide you clean water. I doubt how much it does. And the other problem I see in the Indian RO system, uh, the pump they use is a very low pressure pump. Because of lack of pressure, about 60 percent of the water is thrown out. About 40 percent you get, 60 percent becomes just waste water. So, if you are talking about the water conservation, you cannot afford to throw 60 percent of your water is the piped water that is coming to your place and just take 40 percent. I also do not know, I have not seen a single study done in India, there may, may have been some that after it goes through RO in your house, not in the laboratory, I am not speaking of laboratory condition what is the quality of water you are getting, okay. Is it as good as, as they say? Now, you think it is a problem of India, no, no, no. The issue of trust has now become a global problem, a global problem. And in, from Germany to US to Australia, because of few, very few incidences, I mentioned yesterday Flint, problem with Flint. Uh, the poisoning, lead poisoning. Hong Kong had a similar problem, uh, lead poisoning. Uh, Sydney, Waterton, Sydney in Australia, Waterton in Canada where some people died. <coughs> the problem now has become a question of perception. People have become rich, okay. And what is happening is this bottled water companies are spending a tremendous amount of money advertising, tremendous amount of money, lifestyle. They basically, they have convinced people if it is in a bottle, it is safe. And the US, I can tell you, four years ago I found one California company was actually bottling canal water and selling it as a bottled water until the fellows were caught. But nobody complained, they ate the water and there is another new thing I am seeing in the US and uh, Dr. Venkates can tell us more and movement in US now what they call natural water. They want to drink water which what they call natural, no treated none and you can buy now natural water. Nobody knows what is quality at a very high price in virtually everywhere US they are non, non treated. Just natural water put it in a bottle and there is a group of people who believe in natural water, okay. Now, if you look at water, it is really very interesting. There is a Indian entrepreneur in Norway, he is, what he, this fellow is doing is taking iceberg, the Nor Norwegian iceberg and from the fjord all this old water, melting it, bottling it. And you know how much a bottle of that water costs? He says it is iceberg water, not touched by human hands for the last few thousand years, a very special water for very special occasion. Guess how much that bottle is selling for? Guess, make a guess. Ten dollars? More, 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 more. More, more, more. They, they are selling for, he is selling that as a special, for very special occasion and he is selling them 
for $200 a bottle, a liter, $200 a liter, and people are buying it. People are buying it, and they don't think that the glaciers and the icebergs are as contaminated because of the airborne pollution. Yeah, because the water might have been formed 10,000 years ago, frozen 10,000 years ago, but all the airborne pollution from lead to dust to everything else deposits. Now we find DDT in icebergs, okay? How they get there, we don't know, but they are there. So this guy is selling it and see if somebody is willing to buy it, good luck to him. I, I have no problem. Uh, I mean, he's not forcing anybody to buy it. You are not buying it every day at a special occasion. Well, if you want to spend it, good luck to you. So these are some of the social perceptional issue we need to think about. Why would somebody pay so much money to buy a bottle of water? And other thing that is happening is especially in the Western country, because of Flint and a few other incidences in a different country, people are not very sure what they are getting. They said, supposing my place is like Flint, huh? now I can afford to buy a bottle of water or if I can buy a treatment system, point of use treatment system. No big deal. I can afford it. So why should I take a risk from getting from the water utility, which one day might be flint for four or five years, I will not know what I am drinking. I will get sick, my children will get sick, my wife will get sick. Rather, I will spend some money, which I can afford and not worry about it. So this is what, what is happening all over the world now, the trust the public trust in the water utility last four to five years, forget the developing world, developed world as well, public trust in water is declining very, very rapidly. In Germany now, virtually nobody drinks tap water. Quality is excellent, you do not have to worry. Quality is excellent, they, won't, they do not drink tap water. Japan, same thing, they do not drink tap water and quality is excellent, no problem, but just in case they read what has what happened in a few, few cities, financially no big deal, so they just want to be safe. So now it is up to our sociologist friend like Xenia to tell us how do we change that? How do we change the perceptions and attitude of people so that water you get from the tap which is clean, wherever it is clean, which cost 0 0.1 thousandth of a, if you take this liter of, uh, half a liter of water in, in the western country, that cost 1000 times more than the tap water, 1000 times more than the tap water. Why would somebody pay 1000 times more than the tap water but never question? whether it is good or bad or indifferent. Some say this is because of taste, because tap water does not taste good. Uh, one of the things we have to do always is to make sure tap water has some residual chlorine, as you know. Uh, so they tell me, my students even in Singapore tell me, sir, you are, you are for all for tap water, but the tap water does not taste well. We want good testing waters, okay. My answer is very simple. If you want to get rid of chlorine, even here, if you are worried about chlorine, take a container of water, any container, hmm? fill it up, but leave a little bit at the top, little bit of little space in the top, put it in the refrigerator, leave it overnight. Next morning, open the cap, whatever chlorine will go out, the water will be cool and I challenge any one of you, you drink that water, drink any bottled water, it, you can't tell the difference. So if you are worried about chlorine, easiest way is to dechlorinate it, 
not to worry about it. And this is really true because we did a study in Colombo because we put a new water supply and Japanese government that asked us to check what is happening. Our study indicated that 29 percent of the households would not use the clean water, 29 even for cooking, even for cooking. And Colombo most people had a well, okay. So for drinking, cooking, they got the well water. For washing, having a shower, they used the tap water, okay. And we never found out what is the reason, but our hypothesis after talking to very few people, quite a few people and households was very simple. One of the things you find is in Sri Lanka like in India, when a guest comes, you offer him or her a cup of tea, okay. So, you offer a cup of tea. If you make tea with the city tap water because of the chlorine, it does not taste good. If it is fresh enough, you take it from the tap, make tea with this, it does not taste good. You take the well water which we tested independently, which had fecal coliform and all types of organic things. You make tea, believe me, you can tell the difference between tea done with the tap water and tea done with the well water, okay. Both are safe because you are heating the water, uh, but people assume that if tap water, tea with tap water does not taste good, tap water is no good. Okay. So, 29 percent of the household never use tap water either for drinking or even for cooking. They use well water. In Bangkok now in Thailand, water is good. Only about 3 percent of the household or people use tap water, tap water for drinking. I have no problem drinking in Bangkok but only 3 percent of the household drink tap water. The rest either bottled water or, or they, they treat. So, this is a perceptional problem we see all over at perceptional problem. In Singapore, one of my students this year, she said, sir, can you talk to my dad? I said, why? He said, my dad wants to buy a 8000 dollar point of use treatment system. Hmm? You have been telling us they are useless. So, my father is throwing out 8000 dollars plus the operational maintenance we are not including just for the machine to buy. So, I talked to the gentleman, he gave me a list of things that point of use system will take out. Hmm? Eight of them are carcinogenic, okay. Now, look at the clever marketing, it is a Japanese company, I am quite sure they do, they do exactly what they say. Eight items in the water they are supposed to take out are carcinogenic. Only problem is the water PUB supplies or the water the utility supplies to the people, there is not a hope in hell those eight items are there, okay. The items are carcinogenic, no question about that but they do not occur in the tap water. So, average people they do not know, they see carcinogenic, I can get cancer, my family can get cancer, well 8000 dollar, well it is quite a bit, but I can afford it. So, people the companies are preying upon people's insecurity and fear. So, those are the things we are seeing cell or point of use system in Singapore is going up exponential, exponential and same thing again. They want to make sure that the water they drink just in case something happens, they can afford the money, so they buy it. So, how do we change this mindset? I do not know, but studies by Zinia and the other hopefully will come out with answers. I am a simple engineer, I 
I don't understand the human ways of thinking, many of the thinking. So, you have to tell us in your research, how do we change the mindset? And this is what one of the things. Now, what we will do today is give you a little background on how urban water system came into the global dialogue and what is the problem we see now with the urban water supply and wastewater system. system. If you look up until 1976, the issue of water supply was not in the world's agenda. Up to 1976, nobody, nobody in United Nations anywhere talked about water. No one. Why? I do not know, but up to 1976, maybe the population was low, maybe industrialization was not very high, maybe urbanization was not so high, maybe water quality in the rivers were not so bad, but in any case, up to 1976, there is no discussion of water, urban water or rural water in the international fora, up to 1976. It was 1976 first, during a UN World Conference, the issue of water supply came up for the first time in 1976. There was a meeting, UN global meeting on human settlements and that was the first time the government talked about the importance of clean water. And that was the first time there was a talk that people, everyone should have access to clean water. The first time, that it was just the start of the debate in 1976. Why it took so long, I do not know. I have no idea. But if we do an analysis, we will find out 1976 was the first time the global debate started. Then in 1977, there was the United Nations Water Conference at the ministerial level and during that conference, the conference recommended that there should be an international water supply and sanitation decade, 1970 to, no, 1980 to 1990, international water supply and sanitation decade. And the idea of the decade was, by the end of the decade, everyone should have clean water, everyone. Now, what is interesting, let me give you some of the dynamics that played out in the international system. I was then an advisor to the Secretary General of the Water Conference and I pushed very hard that water should be available to everybody. All the countries agreed, all the countries were unanimous that what we are saying that people should have access to clean water, nobody had any problem. Which United Nations for tooth and nail that why this should not, this should not be passed? The one who fought tooth and nail is the World Health Organization who is responsible in the UN system to look after the, the water supply and community water supply issue. Okay. Reason was very clear. They thought if we have a decade, international water supply and sanitation decade, the secretary, the head of that decade will be an independent person. And he or she and the decade staff will take away some of the money that WHO was getting uh, right now uh, that at that time, decade will siphon off. So, WHO's budget will go down. So, their people will suffer. They could not care less what happens to the rest of the world, but they were deadly, dead, 
they are completely against the concept of the decade. Now, what happened after the, gov the governments ignored them basically, they unanimously said the decade should continue. So, what happened is after the meeting was over, several UN organizations got together, WHO, basically bribed them, said, we now have a agreement that there will be decade during which everyone should, at least as many people as possible, should get clean water. Okay. You as WHO will give you a lot of money so that you can implement that this happen. Okay. And furthermore, when we passed the resolution, our idea was the decade secretariat should be independent so that we get an independent evaluation of what is happening. There was no way WHO would accept it. So, one compromise that had to be made was put the secretariat in the WHO. Okay. What happened? What happened after that? Okay. So, a monitoring system was set up by the UN system with WHO and UNICEF and you have to see how wonderfully you read in the those of you who are interested in urban water supply, you get WHO UNICEF report every year mm -hmm. saying how many people have access, how many people in India have a, urban people in India have access, how many people in rural area have access to clean water. How, how does the system work? WHO UNICEF do not have staff to do that. So, let us take India. So, WHO head of the WHO representative in Delhi writes to the government of India saying, hey we are putting a our yearly analysis of how many people are getting clean water divided into rural urban. So, I need this we need this figure. So, the government of India gives the figure. Okay. Now, think for a minute. If I ask you how many people in Kharagpur have access to clean water, hmm? you have no idea because nobody has done that study. IIT might have done a study, if so, uh, I, I do not know, but chances are if you ask in Calcutta or Delhi or Chennai or Mumbai, how many people in the town or in the city have access to clean water? Nobody knows. There has been never any survey. Okay. So, some bureaucrat in the government of India in Delhi sits down and decides what should that number be. Okay. Only thing you will see is the number since 19 uh, 81 has been steadily going up, steadily going up. Okay. If you cannot reduce it, then, then the country is not going, going to do very well. So, so this bureaucrat sent to WHO. In India, even three years ago, I have not seen the latest, latest statistics, even three or four years ago, it said 96 percent of people in urban area in India have access to clean water. Okay. It defies imagination, uh, de defines intelligence. Now, what happens is Indian government gives that information to WHO. WHO gets all that information from all other countries, every country of the world, puts it in a nice table, analyzes it quality of figure is irrelevant, analysis it says what wonderful progress we are making. Then they produce a WHO UNICEF joint monitoring report, sends it to the India government. Indian government then says, look this is the WHO UNICEF report. They say 96 percent of our people have access to clean water, are not we doing great. They do not say this is their data based on God knows what which in the first place they provided to WHO UNICEF, 
it comes recycled back, but this all the politicians not only in India, everywhere claim we are doing good, we are doing good. So that is one problem. The quality of data leaves much to be desired. Second problem, these in international institutions are quite smart. They know that if you say clean water, you have problem. The water is seldom clean, okay. So, they started on a trick from early 1980s. They developed a very wonderful terminology. They said improved sources of water, okay. improved sources of water. And they did even better. In the first paragraph of the report, they will talk about clean water. Page 5, they will talk about improved sources of water. Page 21, they will go back to clean water. So, they use clean water and improved sources of water almost interchangeably. So, they gave the idea what is clean water is improved sources of water. Now, if you dig into that definition, you have to spend some time actually looking into what is improved sources of water. You have to do a real tough Google search to go back to the original document. Improved sources of water is anything that you can do or anything a government can do which theoretically could improve the source by some amount, improve the source of water by amount. It does not say the water quality has improved, but the improved source, the source has been improved. Take, let me give you one example. If you are in a rural or urban area like Patna where people still take well water, if you put a concrete around the well, okay, because uh, many of the wells do not have concrete, they are just dug, dug well. Hmm? You put a concrete around the, around the well, that improves the source. The quality is immaterial. Okay. If you planted two trees, you can argue nearby, you can argue they have some effect I, to improve the source of water. Hmm. So, it is completely up to you to decide what is an improved source of water. And by making these two terminology interchangeably, it goes to the World Bank, it goes to the ADB, clean and improved sources of water. The world as a whole assumes that <coughs> improved sources of water means clean water and clean water means improved source, they are interchangeable. So, you look in any academic book any academic book, any book by so called experts all over the world, they will tell you we have done wonderfully well with the millennium development goals in 2000. Hmm? Okay. When about 6 years ago at a meeting in Ban Ki Moon, the secretary general of UN said we have reached Millennium Development Goal in the area of water three years in advance of the target publicly. And I could not help myself, I told him, Mr. Moon, I do not know which planet you live in, but Millennium MDGs in the area of water has not been done your people are saying when first they claim UN goal on MDGs on water has been uh, has been achieved. Your people said only 780 million people do not have access to clean water. Ban Ki-moon did not use improved sources of water. He said only 780 odd million, you can look at the figure, but 786 million or 785 million people do not have access to clean water. And he said, 
we have done wonderful things, oh, we are way ahead of the game. So I told him South Asia alone at that time had 1.65 billion people, 1.65 billion people. Tell me one town in South Asia where people think they get clean water, one town. I am not including other parts of Asia, I am not including Africa or Latin America. So, my guess at that time was between two and a half billion to three billion people do not have access to clean water. But by using terminology and the fact academics think that if it comes from the UN, the figure comes from UN, it is correct. So, you look at any water supply book, they will always tell you we are doing very well. Right now, they are saying about 680 million people do not have access to clean water. Those are a bunch of baloney because really more people do not have access to clean water, uh, significantly more than clean water. The same thing is happening now with sanitation, exactly the same thing with sanitation. Just as they said improved quality of water, improved quality of water, improved sources of water, they said simplest way is to talk about improved sanitation. Okay. What is improved sanitation? Nobody knows, nobody defines it. Basically, it is up to you as long as you have a toilet, that is improved sanitation. We did a quick estimate, very back of the envelope to estimate. Our analysis shows, I am not saying it is accurate, it may be plus minus 5 percent. In developing Asia, about 14 to 15 percent of the people have access to proper wastewater treatment, dispose, wastewater treatment, collection, treatment and disposal. If you look at the wastewater collection, treatment and disposal, domestic and industrial sources, no more than 15 percent of developing Asia has access to proper sanitation. Again, sanitation, I am not including just toilet. Toilet is only a first step. Collection of that water, taking it to a wastewater treatment plant, treating it properly, discharging it in a way so that we can e reuse it without any health without any health benefit no more than 15 percent latin america will be about the same africa will be quite a bit less so all these figures you get just be very careful about what are the definition what they mean by improved sanitation you go to delhi they will tell you we are doing great about sanitation only part of the sanitation, only the toilet part of the sanitation. The targets government of India has set up are on how many toilets will how many toilets have been constructed and they are giving immense subsidy to construct toilets. Nobody goes thereafter to see are the toilets are being used. Yeah. I have been to many places in India where toilets have been constructed because the government gives the money and especially Bihar and Jharkhand two years ago, nobody was using the toilets and they are being used as storage of grains and vegetables. Okay. So, again it is a attitudinal perceptional problem, you have to convince people what first that toilet is essential, just giving money is not the solution and second convince the bureaucrats and the professors and the engineers that construction of a toilet and a septic tank is not the solution. It is the beginning of a solution, a very important part of the solution, but the waste still remains and what do we do with that. And especially in the cities, now that we are running out of water, the cities are expanding because of urbanization. How do we conserve water? we have to reuse water, there is no question. We have to reduce our consumption of water, 
so that all of us can have a healthy lifestyle. I am not saying reduce it to 40 liters per capita per day because you cannot live a, have a healthy lifestyle with a 40 liters per capita per day. Drinking water is fine because uh, my doctor tells me I should drink 2 liters of water, not tea, not coffee, 2 liters of water every day. Believe me, most of the days I cannot make to half, one and a half liter because I, I drink tea, I drink coffee, I drink uh, lots of fruit juice and water per se which my doctor said I should use 2 liters, I, ca I cannot make it. Okay. 30 years ago I started doing some research, how much water does a human being need to survive, not to live a healthy life to survive. I gave up because once I went, once I went to Africa, I was, I've been advising several African governments and my friend said, you are on a wild goose chase because you cannot say how much water a man or a human being needs to survive. He's, he took me to see some pygmies who can last 5 to 8 days without any intake of water, without any intake of water, pygmies because how they have managed to do that I do not know. It is the evolution, the, the climate conditions in the, they live in the very dry areas. So, they go easily 5 to 7 days without any water. I cannot survive. So, if I do a study saying you need in India say let us say 2 liters of water to survive, a pygmy finds out he does not need any water for several days to survive. Okay. So, I gave up because I realized that it depends on us, our background, our culture, the way we have grown up, water availability, the conditions, whole bunch of factors which means I do not think you, you can survive one day without water. At least you will be extremely thirsty, but the pygmies do not care. Okay. So, we gave up that. So, then the next question comes if we cannot say how much we need for basic even for basic survival, can we come out with how much water we need to lead a healthy productive life. You will find in the entire world, in the entire world there was only one study done in the 1960, between 1960 and 70 and for Singapore, again a small city in Singapore and that came to the conclusion in a, under Singaporean context, you need 75 liters per person per day to lead a healthy life. If you consume less than that, your medical costs were higher than people who had seven, at least 75 liters, your health costs were higher, hospital visits were higher, but beyond 75 there was absolutely no, no difference. You could lead a healthy productive life, your medical bill did not go up, your hospital bill did not go up, but it clearly showed that under Singapore conditions 75 liters is at least we should provide everybody 75 liters so that we can lead a healthy life. I have seen a similar study anywhere in the world. Indian norm goes to 130 liters depending on the number of population. For bigger cities they provide a bigger. We have to start saying are this correct. Okay. If Delhi is going to have by 2030 35 million people, where is the water going to come from if all of them are going to use, use the current figure over some 220 liters per capita per day. There is not a hope in hell because right now Delhi has no water, loses 40 percent of its water. Okay. Water management is dismal. There has never been what any water audit done in Delhi. Hmm. The last audited statement of Delhi Jal Board, last audited statement of Delhi Jal Board was 8 years ago, 8 years ago. Okay. So, when somebody tells me that Delhi Jal Board makes a profit, 
it is a very strange statement. The question is Delhi cannot grow, provide water 220 liters, forget the current population, but the expected population, projected population of 35 million in, uh, in less than 20 years. Okay. So, we have to see how we can make sure that we bring down not only the consumption of water, water conservation by economic means by making people ethically conscious. One of the things we find in Scandinavia where water consumption is very low, yes their price is high, but their salaries are also high, but they are invariably low primarily because people believe that you should not consume more than is enough. It is a strong ethical belief that is enough. And about 10 years ago, it was just, I did a simple experiment in Stockholm. I, if you bought a can of Coca Cola in Stockholm, then you drank it, take the can, put it on the roadside or put it in the waste paper basket. What will happen? Put a can on the road, say you are taking, let us say I was eating, I went to McDonald's, had a hamburger, okay, drank the Coke, took the Coke and put the can of Coke, empty can of Coke outside on the window sill of the McDonald's. Hmm? Within 4 minutes, a very well dressed gentleman picked up the can, put it in, in, in his bag for two reasons. One, he can take the can to the nearest supermarket, he gets a deposit back, a significant deposit back, okay, because there is a in, anywhere in Scandinavia for cans you have a deposit. Second, they have a strong moral ethics. So, they believe that we should deposit back the can. So, how do we get this moral ethics into the people, so that we consume what is necessary and do not waste water. This discussion in most countries has not even started, most countries has not even started. In Denmark, if you right now, the average water consumption Denmark as a whole is now 105 liters per person per day, 105, less than half of Delhi, less than half of Delhi. In Copenhagen it has come down to about 100 liters per capita per day. It is not because of the price is high, because if you look at the household income, if you look at the household income, cost of water is less than 1 percent of the household income, less than 1 percent. So, it is nothing. So, it is because of this moral ethics, people believe that we should not use more water than necessary. So, we need economic instruments, we need education, we need whole variety of social instruments and this is why I have been saying all through that we engineers now have to go out and beg our social scientist friend, please tell us how to, how to introduce ethics, morality, whole variety of things in human beings, so that they become like the Scandinavians. What did they do right and we are not doing right? Why do they do that and why as Scandinavians use so little water and we do not? So, those are discussions that has yet to began in most of the countries. And the importance of 75 liters, I am convinced by 2030, by 2030 many of the cities, many of the cities of the world will be using about between 80 to 85 liters per person per day. 
80s and many of the major western cities. Many of them are already in the low eight, the high 80s, but they are progressively coming down. But we do not see any such trend in India. I do not see reduction in Delhi. I do not see reduction in Mumbai unless there is no water and you are forced to use it. But I do not see voluntarily or the households reducing their water demand. And people do not care. It's if you go to, as I said, 60 percent of water to the membrane is now just thrown out. Hmm? You cannot do that. The Delhiites if they continue like this, I can guarantee, I can guarantee that within the by 2030, you heard about Cape Town running out of water, a lot of this. I can guarantee you there will be at least five or six cities, major cities in India and the two that comes to my mind immediately probably Bangalore and Delhi, they will have big problems, they will run out of water. I cannot say when and if you look at the climate change and the var variability of flow, it is not the question of if, it is question of when. Now, urbanization is bringing lot of people, we are bringing in lot of industrial development, lot of commercial development, all of which need water. And where is this water going to come from? We have to make sure we manage our water properly. There is no other, no other choice. So, for urban water management, if you manage your water properly, we do not have a problem. Now, the next problem is wastewater. We do not treat our wastewater, we just dump it. I am afraid those days are long past when we can afford that luxury. First, we have already contaminated very seriously all our rivers and the lakes around, around our urban center. So, whether you like it or not, we are drinking water which somebody else have thrown out as waste water. There is no other choice. This the most expensive water, one of the expensive bottled water you can buy by anywhere in the world is the Perrier. Okay. Take a look what is the source of Perrier? Hmm. What is the source of Perrier? It comes from the sand dunes. The, there is a whole bunch of sand dunes in France. What happens is municipalities discharge treated wastewater uh, upstream of the sand dune. Downstream of the sand dune, Perrier extracts the water, okay. Sells it at a very high price and everybody says Perrier water is great. Hmm. All, all you are drinking is like anywhere else, recycled wastewater of somebody else's. So, if we do not start treating wastewater, we have a big problem, we have a big problem and I do not see any concerted effort to look at wastewater treatment as a whole. And one of the biggest problem I have with the government of India and that is why I am not very popular because I, I tend to say what I think. One of the biggest problem in India is wastewater treatment plant, STP. Most of them, if you look the statistics of the Central Water Pollution Control Board, three to four years after their opening, <coughs> either they do not, 70 to 80 percent have stopped working, the rest are working at a very low efficiency. Okay. Now, why? The hypothesis it needs to be proven, I have come to is the biggest problem India is facing with the STP is we do not train our STP operators. Biggest problem, there is not a single school, vocational school in India which trains STP operators, not a single school, not a single. You basically pick up somebody 
from the street, make that person an STP operator, tell them close this valve, put this alarm, put this. They have no background, no nothing, they do not understand anything and they will go by and they do not supervise them. Okay. So, until and unless I have been going to from prime minister to chief minister saying for heaven's sake, you are building STPs left, right and center. You are looking for employment for people. Job creation is the biggest problem India is facing now. Okay. We have to create from now till 2050 at least 1 million job per month, 1 million job per month. And in 2016, we created only 260, 260,000. So, why can't we have a vocational school now that you are constructing so many STPs all over? Why can't we have engineers don't want to be treatment plant operators? Okay, and I don't blame them because why should you? You train for something else, you have better options. But there's a whole bunch of semi-literate people who can go to the vocational school, study for two years. This is what happened in Singapore. You cannot become a STP operator unless, until and unless you have gone through two years of training in a vocational school. They tell you basically what the system does. Uh, they train them in that. They learn what to do, the processes, what has to be done regularly. If something goes wrong, what, what to look for. Okay. And they have no problem. And so, this is one of the things I find, one of the problems I find in the country is we do not look at the system in its totality. We need treatment plant, of course we need treatment plant, but nobody thinks after construction of the treatment plant, how do we make those continue year after year. And the same goes not only in the treatment plant, same the waste to energy plant. The same exactly same thing happened waste to energy plant. One of my friend did a study from <coughs> IIT Mumbai and found out 20 of the waste to energy plants that have been built in India, 19 of them th th three years ago, 19 of them are now working at present. Why? Because they all came to Singapore. saw the waste to energy treatment plant, working very well. What they did not realize is first we have we train operators how to how to use them. Second, for three years National University of Singapore was given a great deal of money to see if you built a waste to energy plant, what happens to the ashes. Okay. If you have a waste to energy plant, everything does not vaporize, okay. <laughs> there are ashes. In the last generation of waste to energy plants in Singapore produced 16 percent ashes, 16 percent of mass remain as ashes. We spent three to three and a half years looking at that composition of the ash, what does it contain, what toxic substances contain, how do we ameliorate it how do you get rid of it. Only then, only when you are convinced that we have a system, we know what to do with the ashes, we went ahead. Now, the reason also I am saying many things you can learn from Singapore, but the other things you must see the difference between the two countries. Why does Indian waste to energy plants are not working? One problem is believe it or not, India has a better recycling of waste than Singapore. Believe it or not, it is a much better. You have the people who pick up the papers, people who pick up the plastic, the rag pick, they pick it up the high calorific value material from the waste. So, if, if you throw plastic, somebody in the chain will pick it up because it has an economic value, they can pick it up and sell it. Okay. So, the Indian waste is basically organic waste. Mm -hmm. 
it has a very low calorific value. Singaporean waste has a very high calorific value because nobody picks up the plastic, it is dumped, the newspapers go, so there are high calorific values. So the burning, the pyrolysis is extremely efficient at a very high temperature. In India's case, it is a low temperature because of many of these products are picked up, recycled and reused. And as a result, the burning is low and the biggest problem I see is again a corollary that when you burn the wood, at pyrolysis is at a low temperature, all these plants are creating dioxin, emitting dioxin and that is one of the most dangerous things. And I have said that two weeks ago in those that first before you create all these white elephants left, right and center, see what your, what is your ash content, how do you get rid of it. Second, do you have the operator. Third, if you burn it, does it burn properly, does it have enough calorific value. Because what is going to happen, I can predict with a 99.99 percent certainty that within the next few years as the, all the states want to waste to energy plant or the STPs or whatever you do, people living in that area will say these are dangerous, we do, we either we do not like the smell of STPs or the dioxin of the waste to energy plant. You can build it anywhere else but not in my backyard. Okay. So, this NIMBY syn syndrome we saw in the West is coming to India, there is no question about it in my mind. So, we have already seen in China. <coughs> China is a very different country, but with the social media being so prevalent, there is so much, so much uh, opposition to building of these plants, waste to energy and the STPs in the area unless they are managed properly they had to cancel, cancel the plant. So, we will see that happening here as well, uh, but it is a question of time. But things, the thing I want to take away from this lecture is many years ago, one of my early mentors was a remarkable lady, absolutely remarkable lady. I have never met anyone like her. You know her, she was Indira Gandhi, a remarkable lady. She has like all human beings, lot of strengths and quite a few weaknesses, but I have nothing but respect for her. And one of the thing I, I asked her, I think it was about late 1970s, I was having a discussion with her. I said, Prime Minister, India has become independent for now for about 35 to 40 years. Why is it after 35 to 40 years we have not made more progress now that we are independent? Hmm? We should have made more progress. Our people should be more wealthy, having a better standard of living, be with better quality of life. And her response was, you know, that is a question nobody has ever asked me, let me think about a little, tomorrow I will let you know what, why this has happened. Next day she told me the answer is very simple. What we have done in India is we saw a problem, let us say a water problem, very specific water problem. We look for a solution hmm? and we implemented that solution. What happened is when you implemented that solution, we created other problem which we had not thought about it. Okay. And the sum total in many cases, sum total of the problem that solution itself created often higher than the solution we tried to impose to solve the specific problem. So, there is a lot of collateral damage. And this is one thing we have to start thinking about. How do we think so that solution does not create other problems? And this is why we need again multidisciplinary approaches. 
as engineers we can do many things and I take my hats off to my fellow engineers, but there are many things we cannot do, many things we do not understand. So, there we need the economist, we need the philosopher, we need the politicians, we need the social scientists. How do you work together? I do not know. And the other interesting thing I will just tell you, uh, I learned from Mrs. Gandhi in one of my early discussions. He told me bluntly, she told me bluntly, you are all excited about water. And with a smile, she said, I have absolutely no interest in water, absolutely no interest in water. And I told her, how is it Prime Minister, you have no interest in water? We need water to survive, we need water for agriculture, we need water for energy, all this blah, blah, blah standard things. So, how can you say as a Prime Minister, you have no interest in water? And then she said things that have stayed with me all my life. She said, I am the Prime Minister of the country. I am not interested in the means, means. I am interested in the end. I said, please explain. She said, every time you come to India, as I was in then Canada, every time you come to India, come and see, make sure you come and see me. We will have a cup of tea, we will discuss a few things but we will not discuss water. Then she said, my job as a prime minister is to reduce poverty, re increase the standard of living of people, increase industrialization. Okay? So, if you want to talk water or energy, I have no interest because they do not increase standard of living or quality of life directly or quickly enough. However, if you want to talk to me how water can become a catalyst for development, how water can generate economic growth, how water can become a source of employment, an engine for economic development. And she said, I still remember her face, I am your man. Okay. And then I learned that if you want to t talk to politicians, if you want to get your ideas across, the important thing is to show not what you are interested in, but the language they want to hear. Mm. And the language they want to hear is not water management. She told me, in a week's time, I am going to give a talk at a major water meeting. She showed me her speech. She said, look at what my people have written that I do not remember the exact figures that India has increased in irrigation. So, now we are irrigating I do not know at that time what it was, but let me say something like say 200,000 hectares of irrigation. Do not take it for granted, but I am just saying a very large figure. And we have generated so many megawatt of hydroelectricity. Hmm. Then with a smile she said, if you ask me, how many house this mega, so many megawatts of electricity can light? I have no idea. I do not know. These are figures my people have given. I am going to read it out. I do not know 200,000 hectares, how many people will feed properly? I have no idea. So, I am not interested in those figures. I am interested in how much food is available, is it available to the people properly, how much energy is available, so that you have an access to energy at in a reasonably cost. So, there on I changed my complete mindset. I now talk not about what I am interested in, but what the people who are listening they are interested in. If you want to talk to the politician and if you want to get your ideas across, one of the best thing I have found out is the way to get their attention is to tell them how you can improve their way of, way of life of their constituents. And when you explain to them how their constituent life will be, will be improved, you can see their eyes light up. And the thinking is, aha, if I do this, I am going to get more votes, I am going to get elected and okay. So, it is a good thing to do because I am going to get elected. 
that is the ultimately the main thing. They want to do good, it is not that they want to do bad things. They want to do good things, but want to make sure they get elected. You see? So, this is what one of the things I found out in my life that if you need to talk to somebody, if it is a businessman, again try to talk to that person how their profit would be increased, how their production will be increased, and we, along with this, how they can go, do some social good. If you can do that, you are in. Otherwise, it comes to one year, you talk to one year, goes to the other year and you say the politicians do not listen to us. No, they do not listen to us because the message, the way we engineers deliver, they are not interested to know the dam is 200 meters high. It has a wonderful spillway. They would not know what a spillway is to be quite honest. Okay. So, things we get excited about they are unexcited about, they are they, they simply true. And the other thing I learned from Mrs. Gandhi, remarkable though she was, we had a very good relationship, I had to prepare for the meeting very, very carefully, because every time I came she would spend an hour, or hour and a half with me, but I had to prepare, because the first 10 minutes I had to tell her something very interesting, so that she listens. Otherwise, I could see, I came to know her very well, I could see that she is trying very hard pretending to listen to me, but her mind is somewhere else. Okay. And she is too much of a lady, she will never tell me that enough is enough, let us call it a day. So, my suggestion to you, whenever you talk, go prepared, does not matter if it is politician, your boss, does not matter. Preparation for a meeting, unfortunately these days we do not go prepared for a meeting. We just go for a meeting and the only thing that happens in meeting is to when is the next meeting. Mm -hmm. That is the only decision that comes. So, go prepared for a meeting. If you are going to see somebody important in the business <coughs> or in politics, etcetera, go prepared right from the beginning. Give your thoughts which you will excite that person, get the people interested and say, I am going to learn something from, from, from this meeting. And I will give you one more story, one of my another mentors. He was the director general of food and agricultural organization FAO in Rome. <coughs> he was a very kind man. I moved, I worked, uh, worked with him and one thing I found out he was very aggressive with all ministers, all ministers, very aggressive. Uh, by that time I was a Canadian citizen and the Canadian minister agriculture came to Rome and Sauma, the director general invited me to talk with him and Mr. Whelan who was our agriculture minister and Sauma's re-election was coming up uh, and he said Canada will have different difficulty supporting, Mr. Sauma, Canada will have difficulty supporting you for the next, your next election. He looked at him, he says, well, if Canada does not want to support me, that is okay, no problem. I will cancel your vote with the Cape Verde Island. Now, Cape Verde Island is a very small, probably the smallest country, hmm, smallest in individual country, so it was very offensive. I asked him, he said, I asked him, Mr. Sauma, you are such a kind man. I used to call him Ed. He was a Lebanese man brought up in uh, France. He said, he was a very kind man. I have never seen you so aggressive as you are with the minister. Hmm? Why are you so aggressive with the minister? He said, with a, again with a smile, he said, look, the ministers consider themselves to be God or demigod. For last 10 years, before they became minister, they were in important portfolios. Everybody wants something from them. Everybody tells them whatever doing is wonderful. And what he found is, if he goes and talks to the minister, the moment the minister leaves his room or he leaves the minister's room, 
he has forgotten, completely forgotten. He said, the thing I want to do with the each, each minister is, I look for an opportunity to tell him as early as possible, I could not disagree with you more. Okay? And he said, last 20 years, nobody probably had the audacity to tell him that I completely disagree with you. He said, from there on, because you told, I told him that I don't agree with you at all, they listen. They listen. They don't like me, but they listen. Hmm? And he gave me one piece of advice, which I'll give you, leave it with you. He said, treat the minister like a doorman, and the doorman like a minister. Both will remember you, both will respect you. And I have done that all my life. I'm not very polite to the ministers, but I'm exceedingly polite to doormen. And you realize how much the doorman can do, that type of, uh, type of help they can give you is really remarkable. So if you want the doorman's attention, nobody gives them a damn to the doorman. Everybody takes him for granted. Okay? So be kind to the doorman. Be rough with the minister. The minister won't like you, but they will respect you. And the same goes for the doorman. So these are some life's lessons you learn going through life. You don't get it in any books. Nobody will tell you in, the, in your book that if you want to go ahead, some of these things are necessary. So all my students, I try to give not only what you need to know on your technical things, but also a few things outside. How do you make an impression? How do you make an impression on people who matter? Hmm? Flattering them will get you nowhere because everybody flatters important people or they get 99% goes to flat flatter. And there is a, if you leave, read the Dwight Eisenhower's biography, a autobiography, he was once asked why he kept somebody as his chief of staff because he was not the brightest person to be the chief of staff. He said, he is the only person in the whole world who does not want anything from me. Everybody that walks into the US president wants something. Everybody that is in contact with him wants something. He said, he is the only one, he does not want anything from me. I can trust him completely. He may not be the brightest person in the world, but he has no agenda except my agenda. So, so that, that is one, one of the problems. You have to tell people what you think, what you believe in, and why, and why it is important for him or her to do some of the things you are recommending. Sometimes you have to ask a favor, that is fine, but ask it in a such a way that that favor will also benefit him as well, him or her as well as you. Okay. So we digressed a little bit. Let me come back to the water, urban water side. The yesterday someone said why we should think about Singapore. It is very different. My thesis is not only Singapore, but any other country, any other city, take a look what you can learn from them, what lessons you can learn from them. You cannot duplicate any experience from anybody. Forget Singapore. Even in India, what will work in Kharagpur may not work in Himachal Pradesh or may not work in Rajasthan. Okay? There is no universal solution. And one of the problem I have with academia is what I, play, uh, I call problem in search of a solution. Okay? We teach our students a solution. Okay? And then you go and look for a problem to which you can apply that solution. Okay. That I would like to submit to you is the wrong way to do things. You are putting the cart before the horse. 
you look at the problem and especially these days you look at the problem define the problem and like Einstein said I, he said I spent 25 minutes defining the problem and only 5 minutes to solve it so understand the problem define the problem and then find what is the solution and believe me in most of the cases if you define the problem correctly with all the constraints and everything around it you will find a solution that works but if you have a solution a predetermined solution and this is why I have problem with uh, many of the developing country where they bring in experts from outside okay. they do not know what the conditions are they know what works in New York or what works in Paris what works in London but with a hundred percent certainty they will not work in all over India or any part of India and I give you some examples of problems I am saying we, I have had this like this 20 years ago BHEL decided to set up a pollution control laboratory a pollution control institute PCI pollution control institute the idea was good how, how do we control pollution from air, water, solid waste, noise, how do you control that? And BHL, the then the managing director was a very good man. He wanted to do something for the country. He said, we are doing a lot of industrial development, but we should have developed a wing that can solve some of how to reduce India's pollution control, control issue. And he, he was also very close to Mrs. Gandhi. So he could convinced Mrs. Gandhi to talk to UNDP and UNDP gave BHEL 7 million dollars 20 years ago to set a pollution control institute and they brought in a very famous American from New York University to advise them okay. I have known him well he, he, he died a long time ago I known him well very eminent person and unfortunately one year uh, or a year and a half advising the uh, BHEL he died and the UN organization that was responsible for running helping to run this institute UNIDO they asked me they said the chief technical advisor unfortunately died can you please go to BHEL and be our chief technical advisor for this project I went there two things I saw was very strange one this gentleman thought water pollution is a big issue in India he was absolutely right there is no question water pollution is a big issue water quality data is almost non-existent absolutely right most of the <laughs> most places 20 years ago had very few water quality data so he said how can we get water quality data so that institute can do some work so he bought a water mobile water quality laboratory cost at that time about three hundred thousand dollars but the good thing is this laboratory if you can drive to a river everything is automated at about 10 12 water quality parameters you can do it you, you do not need anything else this mobile laboratory can do it everything automatically you take a sample it will do that it will give you a pH D, D O T S S or whatever all this it will give excellent idea I, uh, excellent idea now when I went there I asked them how many times this van has gone and recorded you know has actually done water quality thing nobody would tell me anything they said sir we have used it it used it I said how many times have you used it sir we have used it but total reluctance to tell me until a young fellow one time said sir that do you want to know the real problem yes I've been I said I've been asking for you to tell me the real problem so I understand what is the problem he said sir uh, 
first time we took it out, by the time it went, it, the BHL is in Haridwar, so by the time it went to the, the Ganga's uh, 10, 12 kilometers, we found out all the equipment have gone out of whack. The calibration has gone out of whack. And in order to make the, re in order to recalibrate that, they had to fly somebody from Holland to recalibrate it. Okay, he, the fellow came from Holland to recalibrate it. Second time they went out, the same problem. Now, what is the problem? This wonderful laboratory works very well in Holland or UK or anywhere in Europe. Hmm? The roads are very flat, there is no jerking, so there is no problem with the calibration. In Indian roads, at least Haridwar in those days, you have a lot of potholes, ups and downs. My mother, late mother used to say, one of what is she used to call Hajmi road, digestive road. If you go by car, by going up and down, <laughs> everything you ate is become. So the roads to Haridwar going from BHL were those digestive roads. And as a result, there is no way you can drive that van to a place without the calibration being out of whack. Then the other problem, the van was manufactured for high temperature of Netherlands. Hmm? So it could use withstand 37 degrees Celsius, which is too high for Europe. That is no problem, it is mainly for Europe. Haridwar average summer temperature was 42 plus, 42 plus average summer temperature. So the first summer, the, even though the fan was sitting, all the resistors went like popcorn, boom, 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 boom. So we have a wonderful water quality, mobile water quality lab, which is completely unsuitable for Indian condition. Okay. The second thing, we, he bought a scrubber for 700,000 US dollars because he thought it would be a good idea to show people how to take sulfur out of the coal. Because sulfur is a big thing, sulfur in coal is a big thing in Europe and US. All coal has plenty of sulfur. Only thing this poor man did not know, Indian coal has no sulfur. Indian coal has too much ash, about 40 percent or over 40 percent ash, but no sulfur. So we had a van sitting there costing so much money, which was no use. In order to use that van, you had to put sulfur in at the Indian coal so that it can take it out. But that of no use to anybody. So one of the biggest problem in India I find is we are bringing in experts who don't know the conditions, who don't have any, some of them have commitment, but many of them come for a one week, two weeks, three weeks, finished. If things don't work, you don't know how to run it, you don't know how to maintain it, the problem is yours. They gave you the best solution. So this is what I am saying, look for problem, identify what is a problem, do not go for the solution in search of a problem approach. Just because the solution works somewhere else, it may not. It may work, it may not, but you have to define the problem, you look for the solution and then see whether that is appropriate or not in each time. And I guarantee you, solutions have a two dimension, one is space, one is time. What works today in Kharagpur, 10 years from now, that may not be the right one. Ten, 10 years ago, what works in Kharagpur, today it may not work because the conditions may have changed, things may have changed. I am not saying it is everywhere, but you need to make sure the time element. What is good at time? So what is an appropriate solution for Kharagpur may not be an appropriate solution for Delhi or vice versa. 
So there are no universal solutions. The point I'm trying is there's no universal solution which is applicable to all over, or there is no universal solution that's applicable all the time. There's a time dimension and there's a space dimension. So whatever solutions you do, take a look. Is it appropriate for the place you're looking for? Is it appropriate for the time you're looking for? So if you're going to do something 10 years from now, try to project what will the situation 10 years from today. And this is one problem I have uh, with some of the studies, modeling studies that have been done for the Ganga cleanup. Okay. If you look at all the, technically they're superb, the models are good, so don't take me wrong. But some of the assumptions are fundamentally wrong. Why I think some of the assumptions are fundamentally wrong, even though people who did the modeling are some of the brightest people in India. They have assumed the flow in Ganga will remain the same. Implicit assumption. Hmm? They saw what are the last few years. What is likely to happen? Again, think a little. India's population is increasing. India's water demand is increasing. For agriculture, industry, domestic, anything is increasing. So Ganga whether you like it or not, more water will be abstracted upstream. More, there's no question. How much, I don't know. But more and more water will ups, go upstream as a result of which the flow will go become less and less. It will not be what you, you are seeing it today or you saw it last year. It will become progressively low. You have to make some estimate what is likely to happen because the flow will not be the same. Second problem, India's industrialization is increasing dramatically. So the waste load that will be coming will, be, will significantly increase. Okay? So you have one hand flow going down, other hand the pollution load even after everything else are likely to increase very significantly. So unless you build in the future conditions, it's very easy to look at the current conditions and come out with a plan. But that will not be, I can assure you, that will go out of whack in five years' time. So we have to make some estimate how, if you're going to do a modeling of the Ganges, my first advice is to see what India may look like, not now, but 10 years from today, 15 years from today, at least all the cities around, around the Ganges, what type of industry they might be able to do what type of monitoring and regulation they will be able to implement. So unless we can do that, all this modeling is a theoretical exercise. Mm. So we need to go back some of the hypothesis on the basis of which you are building the model. So one of the problems I find in academia is we get carried out by the elegance of the analysis. If the analysis is good, the elegance is good, we get excited, this is a wonderful model. What we need is take a look at the hypothesis behind which those models are being made. So that is a problem I have with the Ganga cleanup models. And, and uh, uh, I've told the ministers that unless you are future oriented, India will be a different country in 2030 completely different country. How it will change, nobody knows really because there are so many factors involved. But it will have major implications on water, major implications on land use, whole variety of things. Human settlements and how they will play out, we have to start thinking about the future. The present is no indication of the future. Past trends are no indication of what's going to happen in the future. The world is changing so fast. Look at, look at what has happened the last 10 years. I think in this whole room, I'm the only one who doesn't use a mobile phone, okay? 10 years ago, there was no mobile phone in India. Okay. Now, you cannot survive without the mobile phone. Can somebody would have predicted that you'll be so hooked up 
enamored of the mobile phone. I have not seen anywhere in the world who could predict that this was going to take, take on such a important role. We will have new developments in the area of water, which I cannot tell you what they will be, will be. but there will be major technological development in addition to social and other breakthroughs, technological development. I have been advising now several CEOs of major multinational companies. And one of the things I have seen the last 15 years is the paradigm for research has completely changed in the world. Paradigm for research has completely changed. Before 10, 15 years ago, all the research, most of the research came from the university. Universities, research institutions, okay. Now what I see is the private sector is spending more money than the universities together. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Look at the Chinese company Huawei. <coughs> Their current R&D spending, R&D spending, I'm not saying other, R&D spending is 13 billion US dollars per year, 1, 3 billion. Look at Tata, Indian conglomerate. Their R&D expenditure is already four and a half billion a year, and the last three, last four years has gone up by about 35 percent, okay, and increasing. What's happening at the university? IIT is lucky; its research budget is going up. India is lucky; China is lucky. Both of the countries research public research funding is going up. But there is not a single university in the world whose entire research budget exceeds four to five billion dollars a year and many of this research are not based for two, three, four year grant, but they are over 10, 15, 20 years. Okay. So you know I spent 18 years in Oxford. Most of the time, I was, I was spending at least 30 percent of my time writing new proposals for research or writing research reports on, on the existing project which nobody read. Yeah. I have to produce the report because that is a requirement. I have to look for money because otherwise I can't do research. What happens in the private sector? You have to produce a two page note to the management board, two page, no more than two page. It will say what you are going to do, how it will benefit the company, how much it will cost and what will be the important benchmarks for its development. Two page, no more than that because they will tell you more than two page, nobody has time to read. Okay. On the basis of that, they will make a decision, they might give you 20, 30, 50 million dollars over a 15, 10, 15 years. At Oxford, I never had a grant more than three years. If I got a grant for three years, it's good. But most of the industrial research, they are for long term. Now, what are the areas I see now? Uh, uh, now, some of the research that's going on in the, in the industry, which I think is going to revolutionize water. When the results will come, I don't know. One company is now working on lotus leaf. Lotus leaf, spending enormous of money examining lotus leaf. So I asked the CEO, whom I advised, how are you going to make money out of? You are spending a lot of money looking at the lotus leaf. How are you going to make money? Because you are a private company, okay? You have to have a return on investment. You can't do like public research. He, s he smiled and he said, "Have you seen a lotus leaf?" He said, "Yes, I've seen a lotus leaf many, many times." He said, "The most interesting thing about lotus leaf is if you put a drop of water, it is like a blob of mercury." 
very same. Slight wind, slight inclination and the water completely drops off from the lotus leaf and the leaf is completely dry. And I said that is very good, but how are you going to monetize this? He said think, think, think. He said if I can figure out how the lotus leaf is so frictionless. Okay. Is it the cell structure? Is it the chemical structure? Is it the way that all these are mixed up? If I can break that secret and then if I can take find it out how it is doing, I can use it if you are a waterman, I can use in the water pipe. Remember, if I have a frictionless water pipe, the pumping cost will be dramatically reduced. He said even more than water, the biggest payback he said will be in the oil industry. Mm. If I can develop this friction, I will make him, the company will make a mint. So, if I spend 25 million dollars for 5, 10, 15 years, so what? But the payoff is very, very significant. So, they are, no university anywhere can afford this type of work for a, such a long period of time. Okay. Oxford, the longest grant I had was for three years. Maximum you might get, I do not know the IIT, but four, five years, but more than that is impossible. Okay. As Cecilia mentioned yesterday, another group of people are working on one is anadroma species of fish. Anadroma species of fish, those of you who eat fish, uh, in especially in Bengal, you know the hilsa, <coughs> you li like hilsa fish, okay. And there is a lot of fish like this, who which spawns in the fresh water, spends its life in the sea water, then comes back to the fresh water to spawn and often die. So, what is in this fish that desalinates sea water to fresh water. It does not have a machine. Okay. So, they are spending an enormous amount of money to see how nature mimics, can we mimic nature. In fact, a whole, the private sector is now looking into whole areas of what they call biomimicry. How can we find out how the fish desalinates itself without any apparently without much energy. So, if we can break how the fish desalinates itself and then scale it up in the real world, we solve one of our major problems in terms because most of the cost is desalination is energy. The overwhelming cost is energy. So, if I can break, if they can break how fish desalinates by itself without any en en external <coughs> energy that could be a major breakthrough. Cecilia mentioned yesterday mangrove, that is also interesting. There some another group is working on mangrove. You go in the morning to mangrove, any mangrove, you will see salt crystals on the leaves. How does mangrove, which is ordinary tree, takes out the salt and excretes the salt as crystal? How does it do it? So, if we can find out either the fish or how the mangrove is doing that, then it will be a ma mammoth advance in the area of desalination. We could desalinate not only for water, drinking water, we could desalinate even for many agricultural products if we can find how these are happening. So, so, these are some of the things we have to start thinking about. We do not know when they will come, but they will be coming. They will be coming. And these guys who are spending money, they are clever people. They, they will not spend millions and millions of dollars if they are not convinced they are going to get people. So, when you start looking at the water problem, you also have to start what might happen in the future. Okay. So, some of the breakthroughs are that likely to be here likely to be seen in the future. People ask me, people ask me are you optimistic about the world's water future or are you pessimistic? 
if you look at now, everyone says we are going to have a water crisis of unprecedented nature. If you look at all the charts put out by the World Bank, UN, World Water Council, you will notice one of the interesting diagram is they have the so called water scarcity index and 1950 very few countries were water scarce and then 1980 few more became scarce and by 2050 virtually all the world become water scarce. Is that correct? I can say with a hundred percent certainty that is a bunch of baloney. It is very nice to show that why. The reason I think that is not going to happen is if you look at India, I think you are going to see a water crisis the next 10, 15 years, very serious water crisis in different parts of India. When it will happen, where I cannot tell you, but I guarantee you in the next 15 years you will have serious water crisis. When that water crisis happens, I think the politicians for the first time will get such a backlash from the, with the voters, they will be forced to take some what they thought unpalatable political decision and the crisis will become an opportunity which will change the mindset of the politician. Yesterday somebody said, sir water is politics. Yes, water is completely politics. But if Delhi runs out of water, okay, if Delhi runs out of water in 10 years time, would KGD Wall be able to get the vote to remain as a chief minister providing 130 liters per capita per day free? Not a hope in hell. Not a hope in hell. Can the other chief ministers who are providing free water continue to do so? Not a hope in hell. So, if I look to the future in India, I see a crisis of immense proportion coming in the 10 to 15 years. It could be due to scarcity of water, it could be due to very serious disease break somewhere because of the water quality problem all over. And that will be the wake up call our politician will be forced to listen. Just like Sao Paulo, there is one governor, enlightened governor who decided to divorce politics from the urban water issue as I was saying yesterday. Because he was convinced that if you left to politics, people will play politics with water. So, he completely divorced politics from the water, put in independent regulator and the things the water supply, wastewater treatment going up very fast, water supply problem has been solved, wastewater treatment going very fast. The municipality is not giving one single cent, people are paying. People in industry are paying. Industry has to clean its water, P you have to pay for not only water supply, for, but also wastewater treatment plant. And he is raising money from the, from the various organization for running, running that. So, he does not take one penny, one cent, one rupee from the municipality of Sao Paulo. So, municipality of Sao Paulo got rid of lot of expenses which they can use for other purposes. All the consumers are paying, they are quite happy to pay because they, they saw they have a regular 24 by 7 water supply. They are still not convinced the water is clean and it is safe to drink, but I think it will probably come with time. So, I see similar crisis coming in India and that is going to change the political dynamics very, that is my forecast, political dynamics very, very significantly. And that crisis, that crisis will become an opportunity and we will probably see it in most parts of the world. So, with that let us, I, I do not know what is Dr. Gupta? Yes, sir. Ah, you are here. Okay. So, I think we break for lunch. But the other things I want to discuss a little bit with you is we are talking of urban water supply, but urban water supply depends on many, many things. Okay. We are going farther and farther to get our water. There is a demand for water for agriculture, energy, etcetera. 
for the next 20, 30 years, I see major changes happening in the agricultural sector. Agricultural sector, which now in India uses 80 to 85 percent of water. If we can reduce the demand from the agricultural sector from 80 to 85 percent to 60, 70 percent, okay, without sacrificing yield, and which we can do that, we already have the knowledge, technology to do that. There is plenty of water available for or enough water available for other, other sources. <laughs> so, when we talk about urban water or any other water, we need to think about what may happen to in the future on agricultural water needs, energy water needs, industrial water needs. How we and I will share with you in the next, the things that are happening even in India, in industry, in agriculture and in China. Now, you have a Nestle now has a major factory in Moga, major factory in Moga, which does not use a single drop of water, single drop of water. They call it zero water and it is one of the first four factories, major factories in the world which now zero water. Mm -hmm. Nestle's factory in Moga, Moga in Punjab. It does not use it does not now take a single cubic meter of water either from underground or, or from uh, surface water. And I will explain all this, how things are happening. Because these are new things that are happening. You won't see it in the book. Nestle does not advertise it. But we see major changes happening uh, in the world from the industrial water demand technological demand. We were surprised to hear now, you need the, again it comes to the behavioral problem. I advised the, I am a strategic advisor, the CEO of Unilever and he was complaining. They have come out with a detergent, same price as a normal detergent. Now, if you have a washing machine, most people have a washing machine in your house. You need three spin cycles to in our clothes, okay. This detergent they have come out does not need three, but only one, one spin cycle. The problem is people think if you have three spin cycle, it cleans your clothes better than one spin. So, how do we convince the con consumer that one spin cleans the new detergent cleans as well as three spins? It is again a behavioral question. He said, uptake of this detergent has been dismal globally to the extent they are thinking whether they should discontinue or not. Okay. So, we have a whole bunch of behavioral questions in the water to answer. How do we convince people that it, and then Procter and Gamble is, I do not know how it works because I am not an expert in this area, is now working on a fabric <coughs> and the vice president of research I had lunch with him recently. He said, this new fabric they are working on, it is self-cleaning. You do not self-clean. You do not have to put in a washing machine or take a soap and clean your clothes. So, you work and it will clean itself. And he said, we should have it by within the next three to four years, self-cleaning fabric. So, you do not have to wash it. You wear it every day, the, the fabric will clean it by itself. Okay? Now, as water experts, we do not know what is happening there. So, if you take out washing machines and reduction in water, washing machine, this self-cleaning fabric takes off. The world is my dear friend, it becomes a very different place and the water problems take a very different situation. So, next one I want to share with you some of the things that are happening in the world, which you won't find in the books because they do not write about it and they do not want to, these big companies do not want to share. They won't tell you they're doing a, they're working on a self-cleaning fabric because their competitor might decide to work on a self-cleaning fabric. They want the market to themselves. Okay, so they don't want to, for very good reasons, they don't want to say. So only way we can find out now. You see, before act, all the research was done in academia. Okay, as I mentioned, in the research institution, my career depends on how many papers I write. Okay. So, even if I do not get very good results, I want to get out a paper because that helps me to go up the ladder. 
okay. We are all experts in that, how to, how to, how, how to go off the ladder by writing paper. If you don't write paper, you are dead in academia. What happens in the private sector? Not only they don't have time to write the paper, it has no incentive. They said, if I write a paper, my boss will say, you are wasting your time. You are writing a damn paper instead of working. Okay? So it is actually a disincentive. Second, they do not want anybody else to know what they are working on. Until the patent is shown everything done, they do not want their competitors to know what is going on. So, right, so they, you find people from the private sector coming to big meetings, but only to find out what things are happening so that they can get it, give away with the ideas. They never tell you what they have done or what they are doing now, which may revolutionize water. Only way you can find out if you work closely with them. And I want to share with you why I am reasonably or at least what I say cautiously optimistic of the world's water future when I see the things that are developing which the academy and most of the world do not know what is happening. Okay, so have an enjoyable lunch and then we will Thank carry you. on. Thank you, sir. So if you have any questions, if you